the lay hunters are up against is how many lays are there and where are they? Where are they? How often may you expect? It seems to me that from my own researches in Kent that you may expect lays to occur at anything between a mile and a half and three miles spacing like that, and that they do occur in these fields. When I say field, I mean it's an electrical sense of field. The clue to this was given me by Buck Nelson, who may or may not have been to Mars, the Moon, and Venus, I do not know. But what he described in his book was that the space people told him the flying saucers travel along magnetic currents, which is exactly what Adamski said. He said further that the magnetic currents are named and numbered. Now, in this case, you'd simply say summer sun lies as the general classification of all these lays, and then you'd start numbering them, one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. So, when he says their name and number, I take it we must look for numbered lines which will not cross. That's to say, within one particular tuning, one type of lay. I don't know how they classify them, but they are classified in some way. And having given yourself a, a, a type, at one time I believed that they were associated with the four classic elements, fire, earth, air, and water. And that the fire lays were lined on beacons and the water ones on moated camps and uh, ponds, dew ponds and so forth, the air ones on trees and the earth ones on mounds and stones. But I find this quite impossible to tie up with the lays I have discovered. However, that's Buck Nelson's contribution. Now, the critical thing that tipped me off about the whole business of lays and saucers there's one other thing Buck Nelson said, which after all, he had no reason to say and has no connection, I doubt, even if he understands what he said. He said, where the magnetic currents cross is comparable to a crossroad sign. I don't think Buck Nelson is an educated man at all. And I doubt he had the foggiest notion that Alfred Watkins was studying lays. But that sentence could be read without the last word. Where the magnetic currents cross is comparable to the crossroad. Fair enough. The crossroad sign can only mean a sign on the earth. And therefore, we must look for landmarks, prehistoric landmarks, because we know flying saucers have been around for donkey's years. And therefore, there's an immediate link up with what Buck Nelson has said and what Alfred Watkins has said about lead. And so I was very interested when, at the time I began studying this, I came across two sightings in Kent, both at places with the actual word Mark. There was a sighting at Mark Beach and a sighting at Keston Mark, two sightings uh, separated by a week. And these three sightings both all linked up the word Mark and immediately began to think, by the the flying sources are aware of these marks. You see the tall hill, the, the stone, the old green camp, the high point, the barrows, and so forth. Anybody who is familiar with Christopher Robin will doubtless remember the tall pine trees at the top of the forest. The forest, of course, is Ashdown Forest. The hundred acre wood is over that side, and this is where Mr. Robin used to sit down with Pooh, I suppose. I forget the exact details. It's a long time ago. The tall pine trees, now known as Gill's Lap, and I have found the word Gill coming in again and again on these lays in Kent. It's a beautiful spot, way up on the hills, and I think you'll find that that lines through with Westminster Abbey, the tumulus on Hampstead Heath, and the Scots pine in Ken Wood. Here you see the wheel of Kent, the chalk got it in, and it was originally, of course, a dome over the wheel. The dome has been eroded away and left the North Downs and the South Downs and the, the, the chalk of Hampshire. This is the lay I have just mentioned to you through Gildare. Ashdown Forest is the spine in the middle of the wheel, and this line through to Westminster Abbey and Gildare runs along the county boundary. This is Ashdown Forest. We're on a different lay now. It starts at Gill Ridge Farm here, on the edge of the forest, and 
Now we'll do a number of marks which I'd like to present to you. One, two, three, four, five. Very striking marks in a straight line. That's only a minimum number. There is a moated camp here at Kent Water. I shall show you a, a photograph of the hilltop here. And the Gilridge Farm seems to be a place name of some importance here. There is a live common here. Again a place name. But I'm concerned with the profile, which I'll show you in a moment. This is Mark Beach right in the middle of the picture where Mrs. Everest, Mark Beach, pulsating white life, light, Oh, 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 10th of August, 60, 1960. Lywood Common, seen coming down the hill in the distance. The fact that it's on common land is very uh, critical because it is, does not suggest for a moment that this is one of those plantations that Capability Brown used to go in for and gentlemen's uh, park lands. They are obviously very old, always been on common land, which has been common since the Saxons invaded and before. We go on up over Blackham, where there are several clumps of pines, and I'm rather lost to place the exact one because it's forested land. I think that is the mark on the hilltop. I haven't shown it on the map. Looking from Blackham, down over Kentwater at the bottom, we see the clump of Mark Beach breaking the skyline beyond. Another one of Mark Beach, a little closer up. This is the clump here. The fact that it's called Mark Beak is interesting because I think what it means, Mark equals Scots Pine. What they're saying is this is a mixture of beech and Scots Pine, which is perfectly true. On the bow of that hill, right to the right there of the clump itself, is an ordnance survey trick station, little concrete fence for setting up at the online. Very interesting that the modern surveyor and the ancient surveyor both chose the same spot. You have this happening again and again, incidentally. That's a close-up of Mark Beach. I don't know whether you can detect the pine clump, the pine trees in among the beaches. This is only about four miles from my home, and I frequently go there. It's a lovely landmark for seeing miles around. There we are, in the gardens of this nice little farm, Chippin's Bank. They've made something of a grotto out of the, uh, the site. And I'm told that the, the water there is rather special. It is rather like the healing water that gave Tunbridge Wells its name. It is calibiate and, uh, and stains the rocks red. But whoever possessed this land decides that this is rather a, a gracious spot, not perhaps to say a, a holy spot, and made it a sort of grotto in among the trees there, a mixed clump again. We now look up to the hilltop again and another clump breaking the skyline. I haven't shown you the trade point, or the triangulation point uh, between Chippen's Bank and this one is um, Kent Hatch, up, at, up on the, the hilltop at Crockham Hill. And you can see how that will give you a line to, to walk through, particularly in the uh, winter where, when all the trees are bare and those Scotch pines are still a very dark hilltop edge. There we have a close-up of the Kent Hatch group, uh, 20 or so Scotch pines, pretty densely planted. Now here we have the whole thing section to scale, but the... Uh, vertical height has been increased. We come down over Ashdown Forest here, crossing the River Medway. This is Gilridge Farm. Come up to Lywood Common, and there is Blackham on the top of the hill. I've not shown it. These are the five critical marks which on the map are absolutely truly in line. You can toss in half a dozen extra marks if you like. The uh, moat farm down at the bottom of Kent Water. We came up to Mark Beach, Trippins Bank, the Trig Point 197, and Kent Hatch. It is surely no coincidence that each of those marks on the straight line drawn across the map, as we saw it earlier, hits a hilltop dead on five times in a row. If anybody says to me, What is a day? I'll stake my oath that that is one. And you can come and see it for yourself, and I should be glad to show you. It goes on up over Ashdown and it comes on up to London. But those five marks in that line, as indicated, this one, as I say, is lost in, 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 in forested ground, and I'm not sure what it is, but there are soft pines there quite clearly. Mark Beach, we had a sighting, and there have been others in the neighbourhood. An example in London, which some of you may care tomorrow to check, 
those who live anywhere within reach of Hampstead Heath. Shortly after reading Watkins' book, I took a walk across Hampstead Heath and approaching Kenwood from Highgate Ponds, I saw one solitary Scots pine, ten foot clear of all the beech trees, way up in the sky. And I said, that's a mark if ever I saw a mark. And at that very moment, I looked a little way to the left, where the one and only tumulus on Hampstead Heath was sighted. And I said, well, that mark was meant to be seen from here, and it lines through with that tumulus. So I took whatever directions I was able to without a compass, found roughly the alignment through to the top of Parliament Hill, and went back to my map, where it lined through to Westminster Abbey. And I remembered the old legend of Westminster Abbey, that it was sighted on what was then called Thorny Island because of a remarkable clump of thorns on the island. And the legend went on to describe how when the bishop was due to consecrate the abbey, a fisherman notified him that it had already been consecrated in advance. And I take it that this was a way of saying the thorn clump on Thorny Island was already holy, and that by citing the abbey there they chose holy ground. For the theory, M.A. Michel has an exceptionally well-documented uh, account of saucer sightings in France. And I picked three of these places where the falling leaf maneuver was recorded. Now, Amy Michel says the falling leaf maneuver is always identified with a change of direction. When a saucer is traveling along one straight line, stops and changes to another, there it does a falling leaf. This is something I used to do in a little tiger moth. It's quite against the rules. You simply stall the aircraft and stop it spinning. It doesn't drop straight away if you kick the rudder, and it goes like a leaf. Drop a penny into a swimming bath and it falling leaves, doesn't it? It does not go straight down. Drop a flying saucer into our atmosphere, unsupported. It will not drop directly. It is a, an aerofoil, aerofoil shape, and it will falling leaf rather than stall. So, off I went to France to three places where Amy Michel recorded falling leaf. And the first place was Mersange in Burgundy, and I hadn't seen many Scots pines for quite a way. So as I drove in to the village, which is beyond the trees there, Late one evening, I had the thrill of my life to see one, two, three, Scots pie on the corner of the village. Now it so happens that is the corner of the village where the flying saucer was seen. And so I went to bed very much content that a journey of a thousand miles or so had been worthwhile. I went on to the Jura, up into the high borderland with Switzerland. And I went to a village called Fran, named by Amy Michel as the place where flying saucer was sighted. And I couldn't find anything that looked like a clump of pine trees. I was very fed up because my theory was falling to bits. So I got out my, my Michel and I read it up, and of course it was not Fran at all. The party was travelling towards Fran, and in fact saw the flying saucer close to Dompierre on their left. So I turned off at Dompierre and went in the direction indicated by left. There on the hilltop was just what I was looking for. They only had one snag, as far as I could see. There are two sorts of pine trees. <coughs> two basic sorts, perhaps I should say. There are many sorts, but two basic sorts. The Penis Sylvestris, which is the true Scots pine, the ancient one, and the Penis Nigra, which is a more conventional pine. It does not have the red bark and drop its lower branches in the same way. And this clump, well, I couldn't complain about this clump of plants, looked pretty good to me. And the pine tree sitting on the corner, so I took my photograph from over here, and then I went up close. As I went up close, I was delighted to see two things. First of all, inside the club were the Scots pines, mixed with the penis nigra, and holy ground, again. Someone had identified it as such with a little Madonna, and there's a little grotto built around it. So I think 
two scores. This is the place where the flying saucer changed course. Well, he was actually hovering over the clump, perhaps deriving some energy from it, or from the ground under it. Well, there was a navigational point, and he actually looked out of the flying saucer and said, yes, that's Latesh down there, we're all right, shall let's go from the other leg. Mm. Or whether some instrument on board records the tap crossover point between northwest lane number 16 and southeast lane number uh, 51. You know, the name numbered thing again. I do not know. I'm simply following the best evidence I can. I then went off to the banks of the Rhine to a little pair of villages, Nifair and Caen. And it was very late and I drove into Nifair and I drove along the road to Caen. I was fed up that there was nothing like a clump or a tumulus or stones either side of the road as I drove. And I parked the car in the woods, rather disconsolate, and spent the night there. And woke up in the morning to see pink plonk, pink plonk all along the sky. The place was a mass of Scots pine. Which particular clump the saucers were identified with, I do not know. I didn't see any particular clump, but they were there in large numbers. So let's say two and a half scores out of a possible three. The lady came to my house and was very intrigued by a sycamore tree, which I knew to be a very special tree, but she went straight to it, quite psychically drawn to it. She knew there was something down there she was going to see it, so we took her down through the woods. There it is, you see, a vortex. Well, I'd never heard it called that, and it looked honest to man who showed me, and she said, well, you see that one, it's a, what we call a curly sycamore. And when that's fell, they'll pay a high price for it, and they... Uh, the timber works because the, uh, the grain is all twisted. It's curly. It's a very unusual grain and very special for veneering. But Mary Long came along and said, it's not just curly, it, it's spiral. I said, that's a, a very striking tree and that's what I felt drawn to. Well, I take Mary Long with a pinch of salt, but next week she was back again. And she said, look, I've had a very important mental communication. This is a center, right where you are. And that tree is the center. Now, if you mark on a map the line went through here, six degrees north and northwest, and clock round in a clock, the twelve hours of the clock, you will find twelve magnetic centers, healing centers. It's up to you to go and find them. Well, they're on those alignments. You can't do that sort of thing. Um, the Earth doesn't lend itself to such severe geometry that you can divide it up into 12 sectors, but... Oh, the Tunbridge Wells, bang on that one. I missed that one. My friend showed it to me the other day. He said, well, there isn't the well somewhere there. And I had this on an inch to a mile map, and it was absolutely spot through the wells. The old Calibiot well was at the bottom of the hill. I had already spotted the one that went right through a pine clump at Burswood, which is a very special healing centre set up in the Church of England auspices, um, where they do some interesting work. And certainly there's a, a spring running out of that hill, which is rather special, so maybe I should be able to prime the Hesselton healer with some of the Burswood water or some of the Tunbridge Wells water. This one up here to the north is a very exciting place where the water comes gushing out of the hillside with such power in a spring of the source of the Dand, and it drove a water mill only a matter of years ago, and you can still see the water mill 200 yards from the spring. A very special place, most interesting. Bang on the line. But what was most striking was that I knew about this six degrees north of northwest before ever Mary Long pointed it out to me, because I had used to look out the window at Chillingstone Castle, and I had a flat there and see a Scots pine clump at Chesterhead breaking the line of the hills in the same way I'll show you how those marks broke the lines on the far hill. And I used to say time and again, I'm sure there's a mark on that hill somewhere if I could only find it, because there's Chesterhead clumps there, and it looks to read towards those hills. There's only when I went down to the clump at Chesterhead, which was just plain Scots pines, and looked back, I could see Chillingstone Castle and Mark Beach on the line, so I got my line with put a pencil mark through Mark Beach, Chittingstone Castle, and test it, see where it goes. So it goes to one tree hill. And this was the same alignment that uh, Mary Long said was mentioned in her communication. So there's some odd things going on in the world. What is interesting is the alignment running up here on the heading, uh, 
given by this particular clock system is exactly parallel to what I've just been showing you running up here um, through Lywood Common, Mark Beach, Heaver and Cockham Hill.